Um, and I'll try to, I, I want to cover this accurately and I want to do it well, but at the same time I don't think it will necessarily take the whole time to do this. Um, she lived in the, she was born in the lucky year of uh, 1666. Um, I actually found some good photos of her, so that's kind of exciting to get some more recent images or paintings of her. Um, she was born to a family of merchants that were living in Newcastle. So she is one of our women philosophers who was not born from the upper noble class. Um, we don't know much about her education. So some, sto some sources tell us she was educated by her uncle, but the problem is her uncle died when she was 13. So we don't really know. Did she get more education? Was this source very reliable? Um, her father died when she was 12, and then her mother died when she was 18. There's this consistent story about the women philosophers we're reading about. Like, they keep having all these tragic things happen to them in their young years. So um, she falls into this fold as well. However, at age 20, she moves to London on her own. And while she's in London, she publishes extensively on a number of different things, on politics, religious controversies, and of course, philosophy. And today, we remember her mostly for her feminist writings. This piece itself is, one, is part of that. It's called A Serious Proposal to the Ladies. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, she famously corresponded with this guy, John Norris. Norris was a student of Malebranche, and as a result, their correspondence was published as Letters Concerning the Love of, of God. If you remember Lady Masham, um, she, she was the one who corresponded with Leibniz. She read this piece and did not like it <laughs> and wrote a response called Discourse Concerning the Love of God. And Astell writes a response to Masham, which ultimately leads to Masham to write a yet another response. <laughs> so here we have the interaction of some of the women philosophers in this period with one another. Um, <clears throat> another interesting thing about Mary Astell is that, um, actually I don't remember this now, so maybe I should pull up. Um, this book was published in two parts, 1694 and 1697. Um, we will be reading from the second part. Um, in the first part, she's largely trying to explain that the deficiencies or the perceived deficiencies of women are not due to their actual uh, to their actual nature. It's not like women are by their nature intellectually inferior to men. She's saying that it has to do with the fact they're not getting good education. So by not getting a good education, um, that's the main reason why women don't have the same intellectual uh, endeavors and accomplishments as men do. So she calls for the establishment of institutions where women can be educated. And she gives a, a similar kind of reasoning in another one of her writings. The second part, the part that we are reading, resembles more of a philosophical treatise like Descartes' Principles of Philosophy, or another philosopher named Antoine Arnold, who she quotes in here, in his book, The Art of Thinking. It's like more of like a manual on how to think critically and carefully, and instructions on how to, um, on how to do philosophy more than anything. Our selection is going to really be themed around two kinds of ideas. One is epistemology theories of knowledge and, and belief. And then the second one is about philosophical method. So let's talk at first about epistemology. Her epistemology is kind of a nice blend, in a way, between Descartes and Locke. So she's a lot like Descartes in that she believes in innate ideas. She's a rationalist. But she's more like Locke in that she, down, she thinks that there are limits to human knowledge. And this is the first thing that um, I want us to look at on page 100. Um, that's right. I do not want us to read a passage here. 
But she uses the example of the Trinity in, this, in the very beginning, if you remember from the reading. That the Trinity is one of these things that we sort of know, but on the other hand, we can't explain how we know it. And so this is kind of, she uses a lot of religious imagery, and so this is a helpful start to illustrate that there are limits to what we are capable of knowing on our own. So we have to rely on authority to know lots of things. Um, her way of thinking about knowledge is that knowledge is differentiated by the different degrees of clearness and evidence in the premises from whence the conclusion is drawn. This is really different than, a way, than the way knowledge is commonly denominated um, by others. So she has a, a unique approach here. Um, I want to read a passage from you that I think is on 102 here. Um, she talks about the difference between science, <coughs> opinion, and faith. And these all come in, course, in successive paragraphs on 102 here. Um, so she says, first, that knowledge in a proper and restricted sense as appropriated to science signifies a clear perception which is followed by a firm assent to conclusions rightly drawn from premises of which we have clear and distinct ideas. Which premises or principles must be so clear and evident that supposing us reasonable creatures and free from prejudice and passions, which for the time they predominate as good as deprive us of our reason, we cannot hold our assent from them without manifest violence to our reason. So science, in her sense of the word science, is not what we think of science. When we think of science, we think of like observational science. She means like pure mathematics here, pretty much. Like, and, and when you get into like physics, physics is pretty much like this. It's just pure mathematics. Um, science, in her view, is when you start with clear and distinct ideas and reason to conclusions from those and the conclusions deductively and certainly follow from them. That's science. Opinion, she says, um, in the next paragraph, if the nature of the thing be such as that it admits of no undoubted premises to argue from, or at least we don't at present know of any, or that the conclusion does not so necessarily follow as to give a perfect satisfaction to the mind and to free it from all hesitation, that which we then think of it is then called opinion. So for her, opinion then is any kind of belief you hold that is not absolutely certain, or at least the grounds you have don't, are not absolutely certain. But then, thirdly, there is faith. And if the medium we make use of to prove the proposition be authority, the conclusion which we draw from it is said to be believed. This is what we call faith, and when the authority is God's, a divine faith. So, science gives us that clear perception, followed by a firm assent to conclusions rightly drawn from premises which we have clear and distinct ideas of. Opinion is when you make arguments that go from premises to a conclusion, but the premises are either doubtful or the connection between the premises and the conclusion is not necessary. And then finally there is faith, which she thinks would be any kind of conclusion that you reach by authority. So you could use faith to talk about things. Um, she does use it to talk about a divine authority, but we could even talk about faith apart from a divine authority as well, just anything that relies on authority. Questions about this distinction, these three categories of knowledge. She brings up this idea of moral certainty. Um, and this is in, in this paragraph that spans 102, 103. I want to read this and ask you, what do you think she means by this? Moral certainty is a species of knowledge whose proofs are of a compounded nature, in part resembling those which belong to science and partly those to faith. We do not make the whole process ourselves, but depend on another for the immediate proof, but we ourselves deduce the immediate 
from circumstances and principles as certain and almost as evident as those of science, which lead us to the immediate proofs and make it unreasonable to doubt of them. Cer indeed, we not seldom deceive ourselves in this matter by inclining alternately to both extremes. He goes on to say more about that. So what is moral certainty? It's kind of a mix between these, right? <coughs> it's something that is founded on good reasons, but those good reasons are not absolutely certain. Um, so maybe it's almost like somebody else maybe has worked it all out and they told you about it, but you don't know it, you don't know the proof, you just trust somebody else has the proof in place. In addition, so the next kind of thing that I want to talk about is our knowledge of what she calls sensation. Sensation should correspond to like sensory knowledge. The senses provide us not with knowledge, she thinks, but of objects of consciousness that we can affirm or deny. The senses, she thinks, like Descartes, are not to be trusted until proven by reason. So she's not. So here's how she's different than Locke, right? Locke would say that your senses give you knowledge. She would say the senses just give us the ideas, the shapes, the colors, the sounds, uh, and these sorts of things. But then we have to use reason to, to establish, are these ideas in our mind, do they tell us truly about the world or not? Um, and like Descartes, Hugh says we need to, we shouldn't just blindly trust the senses, we need to have a good reason to trust the senses before we go off and trust them. She thinks that people make a big mistake in thinking that faith and science are not harmonious, that they are in conflict. This idea that science and faith are conflicting matters goes way back. It's way, I mean, this shows this is way deeper than just the past couple hundred years. This goes much further back in history. <coughs> she thinks that the problem is people assume that faith should be proved like science. Um, and since it's not science, that it's not worthy of belief. Um, I do want to read a little bit of this because I think she says this in a very interesting way. Um, <coughs> sorry, I put the wrong page. It should be 104, 105. She says on the very bottom lines of 104, it is as ridiculous. She's talking about. Re rejecting faith because it's not like science. That is just as ridiculous as to reject music because we cannot taste or smell it, or to n deny that there is such a thing as beauty because we do not hear it. Um, skipping down a few, about four lines. Men of dry reason and a moderate genius, I suppose, will think nature has done something very well in allotting to each sense its proper <coughs> employment. And such as these will as readily acknowledge that it is as honorable for the soul to believe what is truly the object of faith as it is for her to know what is really the object of her knowledge. So in other words, um, she thinks that the reason why people don't think faith and reason get along is because they think faith should be like science. That faith should be a matter of absolute demonstrative proof. And since it falls short of that, well, then it's just, um, it's not really knowledge. Um, the difference between the two, she says, is not in the certainty of what is known, but only in the way in which we know it. In the rest of the essay, one of the things she brings up is that you are as certain of something you know by authority based on the authority who tells you. So to use my own example, if... Um, if you want to train to run a marathon, should you ask my three-year-old daughter for advice? Well, if you, you know, want a cute answer, yes. But if you want to really learn how, if you don't want to, you know, have a heart attack or a stroke doing this marathon, you better not follow my three-year-old's advice. She's going to say something like, you know, you should carry a Curious George doll with you or something like that. Um, who should you ask? Should I ask? 
you know, like a, an athletic trainer, somebody who's run a marathon before, um, somebody with the right background, right? The knowledge or the degree of knowledge that you get from the authority is dependent upon the qualification of that authority. Well, then she she considers what if if God is giving is if God is our authority, if the Bible in her case is the Word of God, what greater authority could you have? We trust a, an athletic trainer to some degree, but when it spe when he speaks on matters about athletics, but if God is our authority, shouldn't we have even like she thinks that and puts it on the same level of certainty of what we would get out of science? And so she denominates the difference between the two not in the degree of certainty, but in the way in which we get it. Science, she says, demonstrates what is seen, whereas faith is the evidence of that which is not seen. So you might wonder, but wait a minute, how come faith is so different? Like, why, doesn't, why didn't God set things up so that faith would work like science, that we could just deduce it for ourselves in an axiomatic way? Well, one of the things she says is that faith is kind of a moral thing. That God set things up so that we had to use our will because faith is the sort of thing that should be, whether you have it or not, is a praiseworthy or a blameworthy thing. That you're culpable if you don't have faith and you are praise, praiseworthy if you do have faith. Um, and so, to reject truths of faith because they are unseen is a mistake because you're asking faith to be science. This is where that, what I just read sort of fits in. That faith, to say that faith is, I won't believe in faith, matters of faith because it's not science, it's like saying I'm not going to believe in beautiful pictures because I can't hear them. Or I'm not going to believe in, um, you know, sweet tasting food because I can't um, see the sweetness. Um, it's just a different way in which we acquire knowledge. So this then, now you'll notice we switched over to methodology. Um, she's got some peculiar things to say about knowledge. What does she say about method? Um, think about this quote here. This is on page 107. Um, I, do, I would like to get a response on this. She asks, or she says, ignorance can't be avoided, but error may. We cannot judge of things of which we have no idea, but we can suspend our judgment of those which we have till clearness and evidence oblige us to pass it. What does she mean by this? Like, what's the difference between ignorance and error? And why does she say that we uh, ignorance cannot be avoided, but error can be avoided? <coughs> yeah, Colin? don't know what it is, you can't avoid doing it wrong. So, this is a little, that's closer to one thing she wants to say about how to avoid error. Um, how would you, or how would anybody, distinguish the difference between an error in reasoning versus ignorance in reasoning? Error in thought, ignorance in thought. What is the difference between those two? Mm -hmm. I think if, if you're being ignorant about it, you're not even but if you make an error, you obviously have it tempted, so... Yeah, so an error in reasoning, or an error in thought, is when you make like a false judgment about something. Like if you say, all four-sided geometrical figures are squares. Oops, you know, you make a mistake. Not all four-sided geometrical figures are squares. There's rectangles and other wonderful shapes, right? Um, but ignorance is just the fact that you don't know. It's not knowing. So, she says for us, ignorance can't be avoided. Why? Because we're human beings. We're finite creatures. We don't know everything. To insist that, it, that we should be able to avoid ignorance means that we should be able to know everything, which she says is crazy. So, we can't control that. The fact is, our ignorance is out of our control. You can learn more things, but at the end of the day, you'll never learn everything. 
But error, she says, we can avoid. And this is what I think Colin was picking up on, which is that how do we avoid error? We don't judge things of which we have no idea. Oh, sorry, that's about the ignorance, sorry. How do we avoid error? We can suspend our judgment about those things which we have until we have clear, clearness and evidence that allow us to make a judgment. In other words, we can control what judgments we make. For that reason, you don't have to fall into error. You only fall into error when you rush to judgment, when you make judgments about things that we don't have good evidence or good reasons to make those judgments. So, um, how do we avoid error? It's very much related to this point. We avoid error I'm going to go I'm not going to have us read this basically by doing what Descartes said if we remember all the way back to the fourth meditation I'm sure you can all recall it with vivid clarity what Descartes said is what she or what she's going to say is exactly what Descartes said you avoid error by restricting your judgments restricting uh, your will to the limits of your understanding. Don't pronounce judgments about those things that are beyond your understanding. Um, we make errors when we start talking about, making claims about things that we're really in no position uh, to make those claims. She talks on page 114 of what she calls natural logic. Once again, this is kind of a Cartesian idea, that it is natural because it is part of every person's mind, and it requires no learning or, or acqui no, no learning to acquire it. Um, it's, she thinks that this is like something that God has endowed every single person with, that God has equipped everybody with all the stuff they need to think about true thoughts. Um, God has also created us as rational creatures, which means that we've all been created with a desire to know what is true. So God has given us the desire for truth, and God has given us the tools to discern true things from false things, and God has given us a will that allows us to make proper judgments with all the tools he's given us. Like Descartes, she talks about clear and distinct ideas. She says that a clear idea is that which is present and manifest before the mind. A distinct idea is that which is so clear and different from other things that it includes everything essential about itself. So, all distinct ideas are clear, but not all clear ideas are distinct. The example that she actually gives of this is of God. So she has a different view than Descartes does about God. Descartes says God is a clear and distinct idea. She thinks that our idea of God is just of a clear idea, but not a distinct one. It's clear because we do have a present and manifest idea of God. But it's not distinct because it's not so clear and, dis and different from all the other things that we, we perceive that that idea includes everything essential about it. She thinks God is beyond our comprehension. And since God is beyond our comprehension, um, we can have a clear idea of God, but it wouldn't be distinct. It doesn't tell us everything about him. She ends the piece by looking at six rules that she thinks should govern our way of thinking, our way of practicing philosophy. And several of these look very much like Descartes' four rules. So she says, first, have a thorough understanding of the question at hand. Know what all the terms mean precisely. Secondly, remove any unnecessary ideas that can distract. Third, reason in order. This is very much far from Descartes. Beginning with the most simple and easy and ascending by degrees to that which is more complex. Fourth, do not leave any part of the subject unexamined. Divide your subject into several distinct parts. Fifth, stay focused on the purpose of your study. And finally, judge no further than you evidently need, need to 
to be so. That's basically a very quick version of the, this reading. Are there any questions about how to better understand this or particular passages? Um, this reading was not really ordered in a very logical way, as far as I could tell, so I just kind of covered things as they came up in the text. She uses a lot of religious imagery as well. Well, I guess we can get up just a little early. Um, I will see you next week, and we will wrap all this up. So the group doing a manual comp will be ready and to, to go.